Hi. <laughs> so we're going to look at that passage now together in Colossians chapter 1 and verses 1 to 14. And I'm calling this the best laid plan. And you might wonder about that image I've got on the screen there, what that is trying to communicate. Something's going to be brought to birth, isn't it, in God's great best laid plan. So you might be wondering already, what is that thing that's going to be brought to birth in God's best laid plan? If you go to the next slide, you'll see where I'm going to go with this. First of all, we're going to think about um, God's plan. Because Paul's prayer, by the way, it's a model of how to pray here. But it's all centered around Paul's wanting us all to grasp the greatness of this great plan. And um, one of the things that the whole epistle to the Colossians looks at is the way in which God's plan is set against some alternative that's being put before the Colossian Christians. They're being encouraged to adopt a different plan. And Paul's saying, no, that's the wrong plan. This is the right plan. Um, and so we'll look at the alternative against that. And then also you'll notice that as Paul prays, he uses a lot of educational language, a lot of terms that really educational terms because he, he wants to see proper, inter, proper as inter, you know, educational growth in the Christians. He wants them to grow in their knowledge and to learn well as Christians. And then also you'll see that God's plan, really understanding that, it's central to getting an idea of what history is all about, where it's all going. Okay, let's just introduce things before we get underway. Let me pray first of all. Father, we do just come to you now as we look at your word and just pray you'll open up our eyes so that we'll behold wonderful things out of your law, out of your word, and that this will have a transforming impact upon us. And we pray that our hearts will be lifted so that we may really want to worship you and glorify you as we just appreciate just the wonder and the majesty of what you're doing in our world and in our lives. We pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So first of all then, we're going to look at God's plan. Now, there's a very famous Scottish poet called Robbie Burns, and he came up with a phrase which is used a lot in English, and it's the phrase, the best laid plans of mice and men. He actually said the best laid schemes of mice and men, but it's, it's come out, you know, people talk about the best laid plans of mice and men. Have you heard that expression before? It's, um, you know... Best laid plans of mice, not likely to work out very well. Well, the best laid plans of men are not likely to work out much better, actually, is the idea. So the idea is that, you know, it doesn't matter how well you plan things, something can go very wrong. You know, the best laid plans of mice and men. In fact, there was a very famous author called John Steinbeck who wrote a, a novel which was very famous and also be, was made into a movie called Of Mice and Men, and it's got these two characters in them, this guy called George Milton, and this yet a huge guy called Lenny Small, and um, they both um, end up, it ends up pretty disastrous actually, and the point is that because of their own fallen nature, living in a fallen world, it's bound to end in tragedy, in disaster. Now, this alternative plan of how to reach the ultimate, how to reach salvation, that's being put before the Colossian Christians. It's one that has the appearance of wisdom and spirituality. That's how Paul describes it at the end of the chapter 2. But it trivializes the fallenness of human nature in a fallen world. Now, Get this, every worldview you can think of, every philosophy, every religion that you can think of other than the Christian gospel will, trivial, will not take seriously enough the fallenness of human nature and the fallenness of the world we live in. Only the Christian gospel really adequately understands those two realities. And every other worldview, every other religion, every other philosophy will fall flat in the end of the day because they do not take those two things seriously enough. 
And that's one of the big criticisms that Paul is going to make about this other alternative plan. It just does not deal with the fallenness of human nature. It's of no value in dealing with the, 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 the sinful desires and whatnot that come from us, within us. So the book of Colossians is pitting such best laid plans of mice and men against the best laid plan of God. And Paul starts off right in the first verse, and a lot of people miss this, but he's already countering this alternative plan by the very way he introduces himself. And he does that by saying, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, or Paul, an apostle of the Messiah, Jesus, by the will of God. And often we misread that because we're Westerners, you know, or we're living in the West or influenced by that. And so the will of God for us often means, you know, here I am in a decision-making situation. What's God's will for me in this particular situation I'm facing? But that's not quite how Paul's using this phrase, the will of God here. Um, you'll see that he goes on to pray for the Colossian Christians, that they'll be filled with the knowledge of the will of God, with all the wisdom and understanding the Holy Spirit gives. And if you compare this with how he also deals with this language in the sister epistle to the Ephesians, you'll notice a lot of common language between those two epistles. Um, you'll remember there that he talks about there in the beginning of the chapter 1, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. So what, what Paul is thinking about here is that God's will is his great plan of salvation. And so when Paul introduced himself as an apostle of the Messiah, Jesus, in accordance with this great will, what he's indicating is that in God's great plan of salvation, Paul himself is playing this pivotal role as the apostle of the Messiah, sharing the gospel and communicating the gospel, which has now been passed on to the Colossian Christians through this guy, Epaphras, he'll talk about. So Paul is thinking about that, and he wants us to be filled with the knowledge of this great will of God in all its immensity, this great plan of salvation, because that's the key it's, that's the thing that's going to motivate us to live a life that's worthy of the Lord, that really wants to please him, and which is going to encourage us to want to get to know this great God even more. And you'll notice that immediately after this, and I'm, by the way, when I pick up all this in July, I come back again in July for a series of talks. I'm just going to carry on from here, and we'll get on to Colossians 1.15, following where Jesus is the image of the invisible God and all that great stuff about Jesus. It's all about God's great plan of salvation that Paul is talking about there and how Jesus is at the center of that. And it's big. It's not just about God dying to save my personal sins, although that's included, but it has to do with reconciling everything in the whole of the creation. That's what's been accomplished by the death of Christ. So it's massive. And Paul wants us to get our heads around that. And that's what he's praying for in this, these first 14 verses. So that's, first of all, then God's plan. Let's go to the next thing, which is now setting this against its alternative. Now, diarrhea is the major cause of infant and child death in Pakistan, where we were serving as missionaries. And when we were living there, um, our friend was, um, one of our friends there was the pediatrician at the local mission hospital. And he told us, that there were many children who died because of diarrhea because their parents left it too late to bring them to the hospital. Why did they leave it too late? Well, because they'd first try out traditional healing methods. I'm not saying every tra traditional healing method was bad, but, that, but in, in this case it often led to disaster. They try out these traditional ways of trying to deal with the problem, and then when nothing worked, they'd come to the hospital it'd be too late. And one of those ways, by the way, given that it's a Muslim country and it's a lot of folk Islam in, in Pakistan, just as it is in Indonesia, you get these folk Islamic ideas. And so you'd get, um, you'd get um, for example, um, parents thinking that maybe the reason why the child has diarrhea is because somebody's cast the evil eye on the child. You get that sort of thing in Indonesia as well? And so 
you know, what's one way you might be able to deal with that? Well, maybe you get the child to, you dissolve some verses of the Quran or something in water and you get the child to swallow the, the stuff, you know. Will that, will that solve the problem of diarrhea, you know? You get all these crazy ideas. And, um, and so all human beings will perish unless they get the right treatment. So don't leave it till it's too late. That's a, a real warning there. But Paul wants the Colossian Christians to know that their leader, Epaphras, has his full backing. And so he really um, gives this guy a big plug, Epaphras. He says, you learned it, this gospel, from Epaphras, our fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who also told you, of, who also told us of your love in the Spirit. So he's giving a big plug for Epaphras. It may be because of the influence of this other way of thinking, this other plan, of, this other plan that's being put forward, that some, maybe some people are starting to lose their confidence in what Epaphras has been teaching them. So Paul wants to say, don't you dare back off, you know. You want to really get behind Epaphras. He's giving you the real goods here. Listen to him. Um, and um, anyway, so that's, that's what's going on there. Um, but you've got to get the right treatment. And the right treatment is the gospel, if you want to deal, deal with our sin problem. Of course, in Colossae, they've got this different approach to dealing with human sinfulness. And so Paul's warning against that in chapter 2 and verse 8. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceitful philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spirits of the world rather than on Christ. Now, a Pakistani child might die of diarrhea because of a hollow and deceitful way of thinking, a philosophy, because of these wrong kinds of beliefs, which are hollow, they're empty, they're not going to be able to accomplish anything, and they're deceitful. People get led astray, and they don't go and get the right treatment. And in the same way, you've got something going on in the Colossian church, which is also hollow and deceitful at the end of the day. It has the appearance of wisdom and spirituality, so it's tempting to go this way, but at the end of the day, it's hollow, it's deceitful. And the Colossian Christians were being exposed to this philosophy. And when you read the whole epistle to the Colossians, it becomes fairly clear that it's, it's, it's pretty Jewish in nature. In other words, it's pushing the same old things about wanting to hold to Jewish traditions like um, circumcision um, and you know, J Jewish festivals and things like that. They get a big mention also in chapter 2. But also it's mixed up with some other stuff because these are Jews who are not living in Jerusalem. They're living in the diaspora. They're living quite a long way away from Jerusalem. And um, they've been influenced by other Greek sort of ways of thinking about things. And so they've got this idea that, um, which we've got extra biblical evidence for, that, um, you know, that they're thinking to themselves that if they sort of punish their bodies a bit and are really hard on their bodies because um, it's a very common Greek way of thinking, that perhaps they could control their spirits in a way so they can put the emphasis on that so that through sort of meditation and prayer and stuff like that, they can get themselves into this really ecstatic state and have these really great mystical experiences. And you know, this is something that all around the world in other religions is, is, is done. Like, for example, how does Buddhism start? Well, Buddhism starts, doesn't it, with some guy who's very ascetic, extremely ascetic originally, and then he pulls it back a bit, but he's still very ascetic. And there he is sitting under a, a tree, and, um, and then he get, and, and, and in this very ascetic way of approaching things, and he's all turned in on himself, and, he, and he, he's able to manufacture, isn't he, some great exalted state, which they call the Enlightenment, you know? And, you know, if, if, if people want to approach things this way and try and live a life of asceticism, you know, denying themselves things and being hard on their body, then it is possible, there's many, many, you know, it is possible to have these great exalted experiences. doesn't mean it's the truth. Just to have an exalted experience, you might think it's the truth, you might feel like it's real. I mean, people on drugs can feel that, can't they, when they have drug experiences. Um, but it's not the truth, is it? And people deceive themselves. And, that's, and, and so some of the, the, the local Jews apparently seem to be having these kind of experiences and it looks impressive, it looks spiritual. Um, it might look wise, but it's not the real thing. And so Paul's having a go at those kind of things. 
So then we come to the next thing, which is the whole issue of properly educating Christians. And this is one of the things that Paul is praying for in the, in the next slide. So um, how do you combat the erroneous traditional ways of dealing with, with sickness that's found in the third world? You know, like those problems I was talking about in Pakistan with people, the way they thought about diarrhea. Well, obviously, you need, to, you need some competent um, um, professionals, health professionals, who can go into some of these rural situations and give them some, some proper education um, to try and correct some of the wrong ways of thinking about disease and things like that. Um, teaching people basic hygiene and stuff like that. And in the same way, in combating this false plan that's being proposed to the Colossian Christians, Paul is praying that these Christians will be, will be properly educated. He uses that sort of language. You'll notice that um, he uses terms like... Um, um, Learning the gospel from Epaphras. So, you know, re receiving the gospel is, if you like, is our primary education, isn't it? You know, we get the gospel, we've, 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 we've got started now in understanding in, in terms of the Christian life. Um, we've, got some, we've got the basics now. We've got the basic idea about how God's grace and about basic truth. But, um, and then Paul goes on to talk about... Um, um, being filled with the knowledge of God's great plan of salvation, his will, through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So that's, that's stage two, as it were. That's our secondary education. Now that we've got the gospel, we need to also be filled with a, a knowledge of what God's great will is, what his great plan of salvation is. We need to have a bigger picture of what God's doing in the world and in history. Um, and that's important for us as Christians. And so that's, the, that's, that's how we're maturing in Christ, as we develop that fuller understanding of God's great plan. And then beyond that, there's tertiary education that Paul prays for, because he prays that these Christians will grow in their knowledge of God himself. And that's the ultimate, isn't it? We want to know God. We want to make sure that we have a relationship with our Lord and really build that relationship strong. And that's the ultimate goal for us as, as Christians. So Paul's dealing in his prayers with our primary education, our secondary education, and our tertiary education as Christians. Um, I trust that we all end up with um, the right kind of degrees as a result of this. Anyway, we've got 13 grandchildren, and we love to see them doing as well at school as their abilities will allow them to. Um, our kids need plenty of encouragement. Um, and again, you'll notice that Paul begins his words with glowing words of encouragement for the Colossian Christians. Because there's clear evidence that they're doing pretty well in God's school. I mean, there's obviously some dangers they've got to be aware of, but they're not doing too bad. And their spiritual education was proceeding well. And so Paul starts off by saying, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your... Um, well, it's trans translated as faith in Christ and of the love you have for all the saints. Um, now, imagine that we could watch our grandchildren when they're at school. Uh, what would we love to see? Well, I guess, first of all, we'd like to see them being taught by you know, good, competent teachers. But assuming that is the case, uh, what would we like to see? We'd like to see them... Um, treating those teachers with respect and obeying those teachers. You know, we, we'd be very disturbed if we, we, if we found out our grand, uh, you know, one of our grandchildren was in class throwing chalk at the teacher or something like that, you know. Um, and then, and of course, you don't do that, do you? Never, of course. And so, you know, that's what one thing we would like to see. And so that's, but you see, the word that Paul uses when he talks about he's heard of their faith it's actually, a, the Greek word is the word pistis, and it actually it can be translated as faithfulness as well, because the ideas of faith and faithfulness go together. I mean, Christian faith is faithfulness. <laughs> it, it's the kind of faith that sticks. That's the whole idea of it. It's built into the word. It's not just a, you know, a light, airy-fairy kind of commitment to the Lord Jesus. You know, when we, when we put our faith in him, we're committing ourselves to him. This, we're, we're committing ourselves to be loyal to him and faithful to him. 
So faithful and faith, that's why it becomes difficult to translate it sometimes, you know. You translate it as faith or faithless. Well, the two things really go together. And so um, that's what we've got here. And, and you remember, he starts off, doesn't he, in verse 2. He, he's, he's addressed them as the holy ones and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. So you've got the same sort of linked word, which is um, translated that way at the beginning. So there's this big emphasis upon the fact that they're faithful. Or they have a faith which, is, which sticks and holds true. Uh, but we'd also, with our grandchildren, what else would we like to see if, you know, when they're at school? Well, we'd love to see them not being sort of shunned by other kids. We'd like to see them you know, having good, healthy relationships with other kids, making good friends, wouldn't we? We'd like to see them relating well. And so in the same way, um, Paul's delighted to see that these are Christians that really have a very strong relationship. So he talks about the love they have for all the saints. And um, it's interesting that he talks about their love for all the saints. Um, we've got to remember that at this point, particular point in time, and this is what makes what Paul's saying even more profound, um, the total number of Christians on the face of the earth at the time Paul's writing isn't really that, that numerous, is it? I mean, it's obviously expanding quite fast, but it's still a very small number, really. And the Colossian church itself would probably have been a fairly small church. Probably, it probably may have been less people in the Colossian church than there are sitting in this room now. So it would have been pretty small. And yet, you know, from such small beginnings, and yet Paul's not, no, no, he got no doubt about where it's all going. Um, but nevertheless, that's what we're talking about. And Colossi itself was a fairly, um, it had been once a fairly significant city, but it wasn't any longer. It was a fairly modest market town now, and it was eclipsed by two surrounding cities, Herapolis and, um, and, um, the, um, and Laodicea, which were both very close, but they were bigger cities. Um, and you'll notice at the end of the epistle that Paul um, talks about having the letter sent to Laodicea as well for them to read, and he talks about Epaphras being the, co the key worker also in Laodicea and Herapolis, these other cities too. So Epaphras wasn't just operating in Colossae, he was also operating in Laodicea and Herapolis as well. Um, so it basically this letter is written for Christians, you know, wherever they are, Colossae or Laodicea or Herapolis, or here at Kingsway, you know. And um, so anyway, we don't know exactly wh when this letter was written, um, there's a lot of people who say he wrote it in Rome in the early 60s. That's a very popular view. But there's no way it tells us that here. We know that Paul was in prison lots of times. So, um, you know, it really becomes a matter of speculation as to exactly when Paul wrote it. Probably the late 50s, the early 60s seems to be the, the, the idea from maybe Rome, but maybe somewhere else. Um, so anyway, but we've got... We, the interesting thing is, though, here, here you've got a small church, Right? And yet Paul talks about their love for all the saints. Oh, I've got 10 minutes right, okay. I better move, haven't I? So this, is not, this is not an introspective church. Um, from the very beginning, they see themselves as being in solidarity with all Christians. And so Paul talks about the gospel bearing fruit and growing all over the world. Now, Unlike my wife and my kids, um, my, my conversion, conversion was pretty dramatic. I got converted on May the 15th, 1969, in room 34 of the YMCA at about 9.30 in the evening. And, I, you know, that was fairly dramatic for me. Um, but right from the word go, I was converted through an organisation called the Navigators. But right from the word, as soon as I became a Christian, they got me into scripture memory, memory memorising some key verses. And the first verse that I got to memorize was 1 John 5, 11 and 12, uh, which is called Assurance of Salvation. That's what they labeled it as, because they'd have professionally printed cards to give you, and you put in a pouch, and you carry them around with you, and you'd memorize these verses. And that verse says, and this is the testimony, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who had, does not have the Son does not have life. So right from the word go... I'm being told as a, as a Christian, I need to know that I have a certain hope. I have eternal life. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He talks about assurance of salvation. The word he uses for that is the word hope. And he says, 
that, the, that, that faith and love spring from the hope that is stored up for us in heaven. And so, you know, say my wife and I travel to a classy hotel and the signboard outside says no vacancies. Well, no, no worries. We, we'll get a deluxe room. Not that that's likely to happen really, but why? Why would we get that? Because we've already made the reservations. And that's the idea here, that God has already made the reservations for us. If, we, if our books are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, if, you know, if we've come to know the Lord Jesus, then we have a certain hope. The reservations have been made. Um, and, and our faith and our love spring from this hope that we have. These are our three sisters, aren't they? Faith, hope, and love. Not those three clumps of rock in Katoomba. Our three sisters of faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, but the foundational one is hope, from which faith and love spring. So let's now finish off by looking at God's plan and the meaning of history. Because there's a lot of irony in this letter. You know, Paul will go on to point out that the ascetic way of dealing with things, you know, trying to be hard on your body and that sort of stuff, it doesn't deliver what it promises. In chapter 2 and verse 23, it says, ascetic practices lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. In other words, asceticism doesn't have any real spiritual power. It can't deal with the fallenness of sinful human nature. It cannot enable us to live lives that please God. But we're not called to live ascetic lives, are we? Um, and yet, there's an irony here, isn't there? Because precisely because we are following the Lord, um, we know that it's normal for Christians around the world to experience hardship and difficulties, sometimes persecution of a, of a very dire nature. Um, and so, but it's not self-imposed. See, the asceticism of the alternative plan is self-imposed, but we don't impose these things upon us. But when we do experience suffering and hardship in our lives, Paul says, he talks about, um, when he's praying for them, us being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that we may have great endurance and patience. And people are pretty ignorant, aren't they, about um, the world they live in? And even we as Christians often fail to see things with sufficient clarity. I mean, these two ladies, one of them was pretty up-to-date with what's happening in the world, and the other was a bit ignorant, really, of current affairs. And they were having a chat, and she was asking this other person, well, what do you think about Red China? And this person who didn't know much about current affairs, she said, well, you know, I suppose it'd be all right on a yellow tablecloth. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about what history's all about, aren't we? And, um, and, and the, one of the keys to understanding what's happening in history is to recognise that in the world, this gospel is producing fruit and growing. Now, you, remember, you know that language, fruit, producing fruit and growing? Where does that come from? It comes from Genesis chapter 1, doesn't it? You know, we were created in God's image, and God... Um, told us to be fruitful and to multiply. And so what, if, what Paul is effectively saying here is the gospel is the thing which produces this fruit and this growth. It, it is the thing which produces this new humanity is what God's on about. And um, there, was a, there was a guy, he was very worried about his wife's reading habits and he, he was asked why. And he said, well, first she read a tale of two cities and then she had twins. And then she read the three musketeers and we had triplets and now she's reading Birth of a Nation. Well, this is what we're, we're on about here. But this is what Paul's on about. He's talking, you know, he's alluding to language back in the book of Exodus, for example. You know, where you've got God's people and being oppressed as slaves. And yet, despite that, the people are being multiplying and being fruitful. And, um, and God's, God's whole plan is through the gospel to produce that fruit, that to multiply people created in his image to create this, this new humanity. And all of us who have been brought in, like the Colossian Christians were, we, as Paul indicates in his prayer, we know that we're already qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And so um, our word, you know, God's written his will. And if your name's written in the will, he's not going to change his will. It might happen in a TV murder mystery, but it's not going to happen God's will. God's will's firm, it's fixed. So if your name's written in the will, it stays there. But people outside of Christ are under the power of darkness. So not just the light bulb, but all the lights went out when 
um, Adam and Eve ate that fruit that didn't agree with them. And um, the entire world was plunged into a total blackout, wasn't it, at that time? But by contrast, we have a shining hope. We are people who live in the light and live as children of the light. Um, but our hope, remember, is stored up for us in heaven. Um, so that's what Paul says, it's stored up for us in heaven. Now, notice here that it's stored up in heaven. So heaven is the storeroom. It's like the bank, if you like. Now, we are not going to live in a glorified Fort Knox. That's not where we're going to spend eternity. We're going to spend eternity in a new heavens and a new earth. So the hope's stored up for us in heaven, but we're going to enjoy it in a new heavens and a new earth. We're not going to be up there in the clouds somewhere enjoying it, okay? It's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Um, so these opening 14 verses are stressing that what God has done is a fait accompli. It's finished. It's done. And you'll notice that Paul uses a lot of language at the end of this prayer, um, which goes back to that passage we read in Deuteronomy, for example, and other passages like that in Exodus and Deuteronomy. He's using language of inheritance. He's using language of um, being, he, he says, being, um, he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us or transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves. And the word transferred is the word that's used for the, the whole transplanting of a whole nation, which is what happened at the Exodus where God took his people out of Egypt and transplanted them eventually and put them into the land of Canaan. And that's what God has done for us as his people. He's effectively taken us out of being under the bondage of sin, being slaves to sin. He's taken us out of the dominion of darkness and he's, tran he's transplanted us into the kingdom of of his beloved son. So Paul's just picking up on a lot of that imagery and language from the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy and saying that we've experienced a new Exodus. That's what God's on about. He's creating a new humanity and, and that's what we've experienced. And so that's the wonder of what's happened. And, effect, and one, one of the things that's key here to understanding what it means to be a Christian is that we've exchanged lords Right at the heart of what it means to be a Christian is that we have exchanged lords. We've been transferred from the dominion of darkness, one lordship, to the kingdom of his beloved son. We're under the kingship of Jesus, which is why immediately after this, Paul goes on to emphasize that Jesus is Lord. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, etc., etc., etc. Every phrase that follows is saying, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. That's what's happened. That's what it means to be a Christian. We've been transferred. We're under the lordship of Christ. So these first 14 verses introduce us to the importance of God's will, his great plan of salvation, and Paul is choosing his words carefully to anticipate the alternative plan that's been promoted by the Jews who not only depend for their salvation on their Jewish traditions, but also on attaining ultimate knowledge through these ascetic practices induced and, and, and wanting to achieve these, ascetic, these ecstatic states. And it becomes essential for us to be well-schooled so as we can thoroughly understand God's master plan. And indeed, it is this which helps us to make sense of the significance of the lives that we are now living. It's only as we grasp God's great plan of salvation that we're able to make sense of the fact that God in history is in the business of bringing together a people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, creating a new humanity that he has redeemed as in a new exodus. Amen. Um, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for what you've accomplished in our lives. We thank you that we're not just saved as individuals, but we're saved as a people, and that you are bringing together a huge community of your people, for every tribe and tongue and people and nation, that will be a new humanity, and you're trans you've transplanted us into, and are transplanting us into the kingdom of your son. And we pray that we will see that Jesus indeed is our Lord and love him and want to serve him and live under his lordship. And we pray that we will do that, that you might be glorified.